All right, so we've talked about ancient medicine up to about the Renaissance. We talked about concepts of health and disease throughout uh, time. And now we're going to actually see what people were doing about it. So starting from about Renaissance era and moving forward to roughly the current day, we're going to see how treatment has evolved throughout history. All right, so we mentioned the Egyptians actually earlier on and that they had the theory that food when you ate it, if it went bad or was putrid, it would flux or move to other parts of your body and create tumors, create infections, things like that. And they had a lot, kind of widespread pharmacology to go along with it. Not pharmacology like we would think with drugs, but with uh, different minerals, foods, treatments, and so forth. And uh, that's actually been laid out in several of the papyri that we have. The Ebers and Edwin Smith papyri list several drugs including beer, turpentine. I don't know how, I'm not exactly sure how you make turpentine, but that one surprised me that the Egyptians were isolating that. Different types of berries, poppies, and so forth. And one fun fact, it's uh, never been proven, doubt it ever will be, but there's a theory that the original pharma, uh, pharmacists adopted the eye of Ra as a healing symbol. So if you squint, maybe, <laughs> Squint until you're convinced. There we go. I will save the Uzanaz. That's coming up later. So moving a little for, further forward in terms of how treatment occurred, remember that the Greeks, especially Galen, who was a Greek physician working in uh, the Roman era, kind of really pushed the, the idea of the humors and the pneuma as ways in which the body worked, was regulated, and how unbalance of those humors could cause disease. Now, it's interesting is because he had a lot of different and revolutionary theories on how the body works and what disease is caused by, you'd expect his treatments to be groundbreaking too, but they really weren't. They were very much kind of the standard treatments at the time with a real popularization, in his case, on bloodletting. And that's one reason bloodletting became so very popular over the, uh, the subsequent uh, millennia, really, is that he really popularized it as a way to adjust the humors. Because you can't really access bile. I suppose you can access phlegm, but it's hard to remove it you know, forcibly, whereas draining blood some, is fairly easy to do. And pretty soon bloodletting became the treatment of choice for adjusting the humors. So bleeding, just as there had to be a lot of different ways to do it, we had to have a lot of different tools for it. So who's ever heard of the uh, British medical journal, The Lancet? Okay, good, some of you have, great. For those of you who haven't, it's a very prestigious medical journal, and uh, The Lancet is actually named for the most common bloodletting tool that they had at a time, a short, double-bladed kind of a knife that was used to open up veins. If that weren't uh, scary enough, the thing on the bottom, sorry, middle bottom right, that's called a scarificator, and it would actually have spring-loaded blades that would pop out. So you'd put this up against someone's arm, hit the button, and they'd spring out, cut the person pretty deeply, drain it, and then try to compress it to stop the bleeding. And then our favorite blood-sucking tool from the Middle Ages, leeches, were in fact used pretty regularly. Now, one fun fact about leeches, they're actually used today still to draw off excessive blood in a hematoma, things like that. They've actually got a fairly good track record of being uh, non-infectious. Their saliva has anticoagulants in it, and they do a pretty good job of decreasing localized swelling and bleeding in an area. So there are, in fact, still medical leeches out there, just not to drain our humors. Now, the Egyptians, Greeks, and others had a large list of possible pharmacologic agents, and the person who really put those together and was roughly you know, around at the same time as Galen was a, uh, another Greek called Pediasius Dioscorides, and he put together a book called Materia Medica. And up until about 70, 80 years ago, that's what the pharmacology classes in most medical schools was actually called, Materia Medica, looking at the things that you would give people or administer to try to cure disease. So he actually toured with the Roman army, and his big contribution was not just writing this book, but he actually drew examples of what the different herbs, the different plants, the different berries, and so forth that he was using looked like. Because you can imagine, Roman Empire is very widely far-flung. What one group of people calls a certain <clears throat> plant in one area, 
It's going to be radically different from what they call it in another. So having that visual cue to know what something was was actually a big deal. So this book was written around the time of Nero, first century AD, and it's still in print. I actually double checked before I came here and boom, there you go. You can go on Amazon and order your very own copy today. Might be in Latin, so you might have to buckle up before trying to dig through it in detail. So as we mentioned, after the fall of the Roman Empire, a lot of the major uh, Western contributions moved into the Islamic empires and astrology, astronomy, alchemy, which will become chemistry, mathematics, were all performed to a fairly high degree. Medicine didn't quite flower as much, although the act of co combining, categorizing, and noticing similarities between different medical problems was done to a pretty high degree. And of the big names, we had Avicenna, or Ibn Sena, who was a very, very you know, prolific writer. He wrote something called the Canon of Medicine, which again was used for hundreds of years up until the 18th century, mostly because it was very, very authoritative and covered everything. So it wasn't so much that important that it was right, it's that it had something to say about every possible condition, and you could use that as a launching off pad. Now he categorized pharmacologic treatments as simples and compounds, and the names pretty much clue you in to exactly what that means. A simple was a single thing you could administer an herb. I always want to say a herb, but an herb, mineral, thing like that, things like that. And compounds are simply combinations of these. So these compounds could go, you know, have many, many, many ingredients and be trying to treat different conditions by adjusting those ingredients to a very fine degree. Razi's, or Al-Razi, was famous for actually doing alchemy. Now, his theory of what things were made of, this proto-chemistry, early chemistry, was called the mercury-sulfur theory. And basically, it says that all things in the world are, at least all material things, they still thought that living material and inanimate material were totally different, but all inanimate things are made of a combination of mercury and sulfur. And it's just the variation in the uh, ratio of those that makes them what they are. Now, when you think about alchemy, what do you guys think about? What's the, what is the, uh, the goal of alchemy usually? And if you want to go to Harry Potter with this, you wouldn't be far off. The Philosopher's Stone, so the ability to live forever, that's one thing. But what's the other thing alchemists were famous for looking after? Trying to create gold. Now, if your theory of material, exactly, is that it's only the ratio of things that matters, all you've got to do is find a way to increase the ratio of mercury to sulfur, and boom, you can create something out of anything else. So alchemists did a lot more than that, but those are the things they're most commonly known for. And it's the uh, process that they did that g gave us modern chemistry. So Razi's in particular developed distillation ex uh, and extraction apparatuses, the glassware that's used to distill things, cool it down, fractionally distillate things, and get different materials purified from different sources. So the goal of treatment, even though we've moved forward and have more tools, is still to get the humors back in balance. But the thing that was kind of uh, added to this in this era was that everyone was thought to have a distinct resting humoral balance. So what might be the appropriate level of blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile for me would not be the same for you. You had your own resting balance, and this resting kind of proclivity for your humors was something that was imparted to you at your birth or during your gest gestation. And so this actually brought together not just alchemy, but also astrology because it was thought that it was the influence of the planets, the moon, the sun, and other heavenly bodies on you as you grew in the womb that led to this humoral balance. So now we're not just trying to treat different uh, disruptions of the humors. We actually have to figure out what the appropriate level is for each patient. And casting these kind of horoscopes became a really big deal, not only for the person's health, and to know how to adjust their humors, but also to know exactly how their life is going to play out, what their strengths were, what their weaknesses were, and so forth. So the Mongol invasions occurred, and we have a lot of that high culture fleeing from the Islamic empires, leaving Damascus and Baghdad. Later, Constantinople gets destroyed as well, but that's further on. But 
the people who fled, the scholars, had a nice resting place in Europe because the university system had been established there. Now, these universities were not the same as what we think of now. They were there to teach law, theology, and medicine. But they were stable. Instead of following instructors around from town to town, the instructors tended to settle in these bigger universities, and the scholars would go there and start teaching. Now, the thing about medieval stat, uh, society is status is very important. We talked about how Aristotle and Galen were considered unapproachable. They were right about everything, and it was just our job to apply what they had said about everything and how right they were about everything to a particular instance with particular patients and so forth. So the status of the people doing the teaching and the people who wrote the books was really the focus. And if you take a look at this picture, it's a really great example. You've got the teacher up in the throne. Uh, as you guys go out into practice, if anyone wants to endow a throne for me in the classroom, I would uh, gladly accept. <laughs> Maybe that's where endow a chair comes from. I just thought of that right now. So yes, please endow me that chair <laughs> in the classroom when you get a chance. But uh, the status was reflected not just in where people sat, but also what they wore. And the high status physicians of the long robe were much superior to the barbers and the surgeons and other people who wore a short coat rather than the long robe. Sound familiar, anybody? How you like them nice short white coats we make you wear? <laughs> So that's still with us today to a degree. And when you graduate, lo and behold, you get to wear that long coat. Hooray. So besides the university system, what was actually happening in Europe at this time? Now, it's really kind of becoming, where should I say? It's, it's less appropriate now to refer to the Middle Ages as the Dark Ages or this time where nothing advanced. Now, fact is, things did not advance that quickly. There was not much change. But there were some events during the Middle Ages, especially when I get to the next talk about surgery, we'll bring some of that up. But it was pretty static. There wasn't much going on. And the medical treatment was very much kind of mired in where it had been at the end of the Roman Empire when it collapsed. And with the influence of Christianity, spiritual causes for diseases, for afflictions, and things like that became much more prominent. So disease, and other malformations, things like that, were seen to be a, a sign from on high rather than the cause of specific, you know, vectors of disease or problems in your environment and so forth. Now the physicians, especially the physicians, maintained the distinction between manual work and intellectual work that they inherited from the Greeks and then from them, the Romans. Basically, intellectual work was high status, excellent, and the physicians barely even I mean, rarely even touched a patient. The barbers and surgeons, who we'll talk a lot more about in the next session, were the ones who did the actual work of carrying out the treatments, doing the bleeding, gathering bodily fluids for the physician to examine. And one of the few fluids that they could actually examine up close was urine. And so if you look on the left here, we can see the physician with a bunch of injured people nearby looking at a vial full of urine, trying to divine the problem that the person had with their urine. And at this time, uh, doing a taste test, dipping your finger in the urine to kind of dab it on your tongue was actually something they did to try to characterize it further. If you had diabetes, you know, maybe that would pay off. There might be sugar in there. Otherwise, not so much. Actually, it's worth mentioning that uh, one of the Islamic scholars and also in China, they had a way of diagnosing uh, diabetes of that nature in urine by pouring it on the ground and seeing if ants came up to it afterwards. But these guys were looking at urine to try to divine every possible disease they could, and we have in the middle a urine wheel. This is actually a collection of this color urine equals this sign, that 11 o'clock green one, that's very concerning. But the urine wheel was one way that these physicians actually tried to uh, diagnose problems with their patients, and the barbers and surgeons were the people who actually did the gathering. And on the right, we have actually a surgeon inserting a catheter. Someone has a urethral stricture probably, isn't able to pass urine on their own, so the barber's helping them so that then the physician can look at the urine and diagnose what sort of treatment to prescribe. Now, not a terrible idea. There are things you can glean from looking at urine. So, on the, uh, the, one, the picture on the left, 
which one of those samples is the one that makes you want to think, ooh, the cloudy one or the clear one? Cloudy one. So yeah, UTI, myoglobinuria, you've got breakdown of muscle products in the urine and hematuria, blood in the urine. Now these physicians probably didn't know what the, uh, actually certainly didn't know what the basis of these problems were, but they could tell something was wrong and then they would try to intercede with the treatments they had at the time. Whether those treatments worked or not, blind chance, or we're just hoping that the patient would get better anyway, in which case physicians can take credit. Hard to go through medicine in the Middle Ages and not talk about one of the most traumatic things that happened in all of human history. That would be the Great Mortality, the Black Death, or the Bubonic Plague. So it came along, and the Great Mortality was actually what it was called at the time, and killed, depending on your sources, between a third and a half of people in Europe at the time. Now, the plague came to Europe through the Mongol invasion. They were actually besieging a uh, town in Asia Minor on the Black Sea called Kaffa. And uh, before they left, they uh, gave us the first instance of biological warfare that we're aware of in human history. They catapulted uh, bodies of those Mongol invaders who died of plague into the town and then left because their ranks were being decimated by the plague. And the plague then set up shop in Kaffa. Gen uh, Genoese traders from Italy went back to their town and the plague spread through Europe. It's a really interesting pattern. It spreads over land, but it spreads over land very slowly, but it hops from port to port because people were bringing, as we now know, fleas and rats that were spreading the plague through the ships. So it hops from port to port and it kind of makes a uh, clockwise circle through Europe hits Iceland a little bit late, but it does hit it, and then makes it all the way to Russia much later on. So the Black Death spreads very slowly through Europe. People know it's coming, but they can't do much about it. But knowing that it's coming meant that people were panicked, and they blamed the plague on the standard things, divine wrath. Uh, Jewish communities came in for a lot of prejudice and a lot of isolation and flat-out murder during this time because certain communities said that the Jewish communities were poisoning wells, Turns out the places where they executed the Jewish communities still got the plague, but they never really put two and two together. And the idea that contagion, this nebulous kind of spreading of disease from person to person was understood, but it wasn't really known how that happened. Just that if you were sick, people around you tended to get sick as well. And we're still discovering plague pits during um, construction projects in various parts of Europe where people's bodies were just thrown uh, who's seen Monty Python and the Holy Grail? The bring out your dead scene? Yeah, that's pretty much straight on. If you haven't seen that, talk to somebody who raised their hand. It's hilarious. Nothing like, I guess, uh, what's the phrase? Comedy equals tragedy plus time. Okay, we can laugh about the back plague at this point. So one prevalent theory was that earthquakes had actually opened up bad air that was stored underground, and these miasmas were what was spreading the plague, moving from place to place. Now, think about it for a second. If you have people who are miners, miners knew that there was, in fact, bad air in mines, that there was bad air stored underground because people would encounter pockets of CO2, pockets of other noxious gases that would kill them. So the idea was that these gas pockets or this bad air was getting out of the ground and causing the disease. So. The idea that was put forward to explain that was that just like the human body is imbued with characteristics based on the stars, heavenly bodies that are present at the time, that areas of the earth had different exposure to the different stars as well, and that is what caused gold to form, silver to form, different minerals to form, and in very bad, impropitious times, bad air to form. So you could actually have that formation getting worse and worse over time. And that's how some people explained the Black Plague acting up now, is that they were astrologically in a really bad place where that air was forming underground all the time. Now, one way to fight bad air was with good air. So you would carry around perfumed stuff. People would have little satchels of herbs and flowers they'd carry around, keep up to their face. The uh, plague doctor, the reason this suit exists is because that nose cone wasn't there to look like a bird per se. It was to pack spices and flowers and other aromatic things in to fight off the bad air. Now what's funny is they thought that's why they were protected from the plague, but in fact, 
wearing that, boil, that oiled leather, gloves, using a pointer stick, heavy boots, they basically created a hazmat suit that kept fleas off of them, and they assumed that the reason they didn't get sick as often was because of the good air stored inside the nose cone. Uh, just be aware, the classic plague doctor suit didn't really come around until the 1700s, or 17th century, pardon me. So they had variations on it earlier, but it didn't really look like the classic Halloween costume until relatively later. Uh, one of my favorite little bits of trivia is the, uh, some people decided the best way to fight bad air is with even worse air. So in places where that theory took hold, people would go into communal latrines and just like <sighs> try to sniff the most awful possible human effluvia that they could <laughs> get around to try to fight off the bad air that way. So, yeah. <laughs> And by the way, that's bad. That's a, that's something that smells bad by the standards of medieval Europe. So ponder that for a second. <laughs> All right. So another way that people thought that they could treat and intercede when disease or other things were happening was magic. Magic is not what we think of it now. It wasn't thought that way then. Magic was considered to be the study of how the natural world is organized and how that organization can be understood and harnessed for our own uses. So magicians were not universally disliked in the Middle Ages. There were often court magicians. One famous one for Elizabeth II was John Dee. He was a court magician. And the idea was that you could use magic for good or for evil. And this really is kind of prefiguring science. Science is a development of that same process of examining the natural world, but the underlying assumptions are very different. Uh, magical theory, one of the main ideas behind it was that there were natural sympathies in the world that had been put there by God at the time of creation, and you could you know, use this quote-unquote doctrine of signatures to figure out what things were linked to other things and maybe find a way to help someone that, with that. Now, those of you who were here last year, resist the urge to shout out the right answer, so leave this for only new people. But it's time for us to play Magical Clinical Case Studies. Someday I'll sneak one of these into a complex question. I just know it. I've snuck other jokes into textbooks before. I could do this again, okay. So, a knight is constantly feverish and phlegmatic, producing copious nasal discharge. His imbalance is brought about by an excess of phlegm weakening his brain. What dietary intervention might the doctrine of signatures suggest? What do you guys think? What do you feed somebody with a weak brain? What's that? Brains. Okay, you could feed them brains. Something a little less obvious, though. Brains, like other uh, animal products and meat, were kind of hard to come by back in the Middle Ages. It wasn't a real staple. Actually, what's... Quick aside, nutrition-wise, uh, because meat was so hard to come by, royalty and the rich ate it, and they thought that vegetables were poor people food, which is why the rich people actually got sicker with gout and other things, because they actually thought vegetables were, you know, below them to eat. Anyhow, what can you get, what, what makes you think of a brain? What kind of foods make you think of brains? Walnuts, there you go, nice job. So walnuts might think, well, they need to strengthen this person's brain because obviously this phlegm, which is naturally brain material leaking out our nose, as the Greeks thought, needs to be strengthened. So you'd give them some walnuts. All right, next question. You have a Venetian merchant. He has a naturally cold disposition due to his horoscope, needs to eat more warming foods. But, darn it, the Ottomans have blockaded Constantinople and we can't get spices through like we used to. So his other hot foods, these hot spices can't get through. So what other sort of food might you give someone with a naturally cold disposition to help? Man, this table's got it down. You sure you weren't here last year? Sunflowers. Why would sunflowers be naturally warm? Looks like the sun. And what do sunflowers do as the day proceeds? They follow the sun. Come on. So yeah, there we go. Okay. Gonna leave that up there for a second. Oh, let me tell you about sword balm. Okay. So, when someone was wounded with a sword or a knife, the thought was that 
there retained a connection between the wounding implement, the tool, and the person's wound. And if you didn't really have anything that would help treat the wound, which they didn't, they would take balm or kind of an ointment, they would rub it on the weapon <laughs> to say, okay, by soothing the weapon, we will soothe the wound and make the wound heal faster. So yeah, I'm just picturing, you know, some dude bleeding to death while they're like, oh, you poor sword, oh, <laughs> let's, let's shine you right up, okay. All right, so moving from this medieval kind of conglomeration of theories and moving towards the scientific consensus, you know, that we were starting to build as the Enlightenment came along, we have someone very early on, not really a, a scientist, but someone who is starting to see a lot of the problems that were present in the existing system and intercede with us. And this is Paracelsus. And I love that his real name is Philippus Ariolus Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim. And he earned, he earned every one of those you know, syllables in his name because he was a very bombastic, and I think that's part of the name, and very kind of um, belligerent person. He brought this idea of medicine together with the ideas of metallurgy that were present at the time, as well as um, the early pharmacology, use of uh, different herbs and plants, and he's considered the father of toxicology. He studied very broadly. He knew a lot about a lot of things, and unlike a lot of people, he got his hands dirty. He thought you learned a lot more by doing things and looking to people who actually made things like miners and engineers and artists than you learned from reading old books. In fact, it's known that he uh, had publicly burned copies of Avicenna and Galen before one of his lectures just to underscore to people that he was not following the established authorities. Uh, he was involved in alchemy and he added salt to the sulfur-mercury mix. Now, we know that that really didn't make much difference, but he was trying to play around with the received wisdom at the time. He related different plants to different diseases and he's the person, as the quote-unquote father of toxicology, who came up phrased differently, but the idea that it is the dose that makes the poison, and that something that's dangerous might be therapeutic at some level, and something that's helpful might be deadly at certain levels as well. Now, he lectured in German instead of Latin, and this was a huge um, faux pas in the established authority of the time, because you were only supposed to really keep your instructions to the educated elites. And, you know, as he said, broke with a lot of tradition, showed contempt for the established authorities. And as you can expect from a personality like this, he bounced from town to town after getting into arguments with literally everyone he could find along the way who disagreed with him. And one of the best little quotes is that uh, it's thought that he never actually wrote any of his works down, but they're transcriptions that he sort of kind of narrated to students as he kind of became drunker and drunker in taverns throughout his travels across you know, the, German, the German states. Now, moving a little forward, about the same time, the idea that we had to have consistent production and sources we could trust became more prominent. And starting in Padua, the same place Vesalius uh, kind of created modern anatomy, they had the first botanical garden made exclusively for medical use. And in fact, it's still there. It's still operating to this day. There's still a botanical garden on the grounds of the School of Medicine there because they wanted to have access to the various simples that they needed to create their medicines and investigate them. There's a very good chance I will see it this summer. Wish me luck. Okay. Now, it's a bit of a jump from those simples to nutrition, but we're gonna kinda of use that as a bridging point because a lot of different things start coming together at this point from various areas. And one thing is, as people develop new problems, people look for new solutions. And one new problem, as we entered the quote unquote age of discovery and oceanic voyages across the Pacific and Atlantic started to happen, is that so, uh, sailors would get very sick with scurvy which we know to be a vitamin C deficiency, but at the time it was just thought to be due to the bad air, the poor hygiene, which I'm sure was accurate aboard these ships, and without the uh, vitamin C that they needed, their teeth would fall out, their gums would bleed, they'd be very tired. Uh, actually, the scars that held old wounds together, that collagen would dissipate and old wounds would reopen. And a British surgeon in 1747, uh, kind of James Lind, actually did some studies about the nutrition and the diet of the sailors aboard a ship and found 
that the people who were given certain vegetables or fruits, particularly citrus, didn't develop scurvy. And he presented this, it took a while to catch on, didn't go right away, but eventually the British realized this was a massively important way to keep their sailing, uh, both commercial and military, their sailors uh, healthy. And the British Navy was for a very long time considered to be the dominant Navy in Europe. And part of it has to do with the uh, citrus fruits, limes especially, being used on board their ship to keep the sailors healthier than their opponents. And that's one reason you might hear British people called limeys. It's actually meant to be for British sailors because they were always having limes and kind of sucking on lime juice. Now the simples are nice, but trying to figure out why these different uh, botanicals worked was something that people had a little trouble with, but the art of distilling and coming up with ways to isolate things from natural sources became much more pronounced as we moved into the modern era. And in 1785, a guy named William Withering got the idea that foxglove, which is a poison, could actually be used to treat um, heart failure. Now at the time it was called dropsy and it was just known that people got very edematous, they had a lot of excess fluid and their pulse would get weak and they'd eventually die. But he figured out, uh, put on this track by a uh, woman herbalist and healer, that a little bit of foxglove would actually help these people shed that water weight because it was going to allow them to get some of that excess fluid out of their body. Now the problem is, if you give them a little too much, they would die. So this foxglove you had to worry about was it how pure was it? How much of the active ingredient was in there? Was it old? Had it, had it kind of become a little less effective or was it too effective? But the idea that you could use this and then actually isolate something from it was very important. So his success with it has actually given us digitalis and digoxin and awakened the idea that you could actually find um, components of different things that had the active ingredient in it rather than just giving people the simple itself. Now the 17 and 1800s is really when the breakdown in humoral theory and the established authorities of medical and scientific history begins in earnest. And that's when we really start to see the beginning of science and the scientific revolution. Now, just remember, it didn't come out of nowhere. Chemistry came from alchemy, astronomy, came from astrology, there were just a, there was a new approach to looking at what these things actually meant, what they signified, and if they worked. So the uh, astrology, alchemy, and magic really kind of came under scrutiny, and as people looked to see if they actually could do what they said, they usually found not so much. But the fact that we had all that data and all those techniques available meant that when we looked at it differently, we were able to get different findings out of that. So the Enlightenment is basically the, the period of time when we say that we've really thrown off a lot of old superstitions, old authorities that weren't serving us anymore, and we came up with new ways of looking at things, both in science and government and business. It's never quite that easy, but it's a fairly decent generalization that that Enlightenment period is when things changed because people were willing to try something new. Uh, one thing that was noticed is a guy named Galvani, realized that uh, he was doing experiments on frog's legs and had them hanging on wires in his castle, basically, and that during an electrical storm, they would start to twitch. So he thought, hmm, there's something with this electricity in the air that's actually causing the muscles to twitch, and therefore muscles must have some sort of an electric idea. Now, electricity was in its very infancy at this point, so not much was known about why it worked, but he knew something was going on. He related these uh, findings abroad, and another guy, Emmanuel Volta, figured out that animal electricity was really just chemical reactions, and you could get the same effect with zinc and copper applied to the muscle that you got from that kind of odd static discharge that might be occurring in the air during a storm. Now, my favorite fluid from this era was called phlogiston. Phlogiston is the fluid that allowed things to burn. So if you give me a... Uh, piece of wood, phlogiston theory would say, oh, this thing is just completely saturated with phlogiston. It's got a ton of phlogiston in it. And then you burn it, and it's been deflogenated. And things that couldn't burn, like rocks, just had no phlogiston in them in, in any way. One other thing that's funny about scientific progress is 
people don't give up their theories right away. Now, sometimes that's good because you want to see if everything has been done right. But uh, when it was noted that phlogiston didn't explain why wood weighed a lot more than the ashes that came from it, they would say, well, it probably just had the phlogiston or they said phlogiston has negative weight. That's why we can explain the discrepancies in the weight and the different things that we have as a result of it. But phlogiston obviously didn't stand the test of time. Another you know, crazy theory we had was this thing called electrical fire. And that electrical fire was you know, present in the world and could be harnessed. And the big proponent of that was our buddy, Ben Franklin. And it is now the fundamental basis of our entire society. So electricity and electronics, we have Ben Franklin to thank for that. You can see the uh, famous experiment proving that electricity and lightning in the clouds is the same as the electrical effects that they saw on Earth. I don't think there were probably that many cherubs present at the moment of discovery, but you know, one can hope. That's pretty good, although I've got to tell you, my favorite rendition of this event is uh, here. <laughs> ben Franklin stealing thunder from Zeus himself, or lightning from Zeus himself, pardon me. So yeah. That's the version I choose to believe in. Your, your mileage can vary. <laughs> All right, and our last kind of one of these fluids that people would come up with to explain natural phenomena, now that they were looking for new ways to explain things, was called animal magnetism. And the guy who discovered it is called Franz Anton Mesmer. Now, who's ever heard of someone having had a magnetic personality? Have you guys ever heard that before? Have you ever heard of someone being mesmerized? Well, that's because of this guy. It's just describing his name. That term never existed before. He theorized that there was this thing called animal magnetism that flowed throughout the universe and that blockages of it could cause nervous diseases. And he was practicing in Vienna, which was a very rigid society, very repressed, and there were a lot of people with nervous, what we would now call you know, nervous psychiatric conditions. And his treatments of trying to unblock their animal magnetism actually had some effect. He was able to get a decent effect on a lot of these patients through his therapy, and maybe it's because he was actually paying attention to these people and actually trying to assist them and they felt reassured by this. But he insisted that any good result he had was due to the flow of animal magnetism through the universe and through him and through his patients. And his writings on it were very contradictory. Like, he really didn't seem to have a consistent theory on how it worked. But because he refused to kind of uh, allow any other interpretation of things to happen, he kind of lost out. And he didn't have the long-lasting effect he could. And later on, people who applied the same sort of treatment, like Freud, Carl Jung, actually did come up with the foundations of psychi psychiatric care. So by insisting on this theory of kind of the, on his theory over the actual practical effects, he lost his credibility, and this impeded flow was picked up by other people, including A.T. Still, the idea that you can impede flow through vessels, through nerves, you can have compressions or swellings in areas, was something applied to early osteopathy and bears now. And uh, one of my favorite books that I've uh, found for my children was actually their children's book of this, because one of the people enlisted by the King of England to um, determine whether Mesmer was on the level or whether there was actually anything to his findings was Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin was in France. He was there as a delegation from the American um, colonies to uh, solicit help from France in the Revolutionary War. And we think, whenever we as Americans think of Ben Franklin, we think probably of his revolutionary era activities. But he was one of the most famous scientists in the world and was kind of actually a big celebrity in France because he kind of looked like, what we call it now would be like a hillbilly scientist. He walked around with a coonskin cap and you know spoke kind of rough French and people thought he was just hilarious, but he was also incredibly bright and they appreciated him for that. But he was one of the people who showed that Mesmer's um, results were due to kind of suggestion of the patients rather than any actual physical effect. All right, so, Trying to figure out how to treat people goes hand in hand with assessing their health. And assessment of health became 
better and better over time as people were looking for new ways to do so. So even though we th had a better idea about where disease come from, finding ways to assess it was important. And auscultation and percussion, actually kind of tapping on people, percussing them, something you guys do to this day, was popularized by a guy named John Nicolas Covasar. And he just, you can also thank him, he's the guy who came up with the idea of grand rounds, that we should just have the students follow the doctors from bed to bed in various hospitals and clinical places. And he figured out that you could actually check on fluid in the abdomen, fluid in the chest cavity by tapping and listening to the dullness or the resonance of it. And he got this idea because his father was a tavern keeper and would have to occasionally figure out, okay, how much wine is left in this barrel? And he'd tap it to try to figure out where the fluid level was. And Corvassar basically did the same thing to patients because he knew that there was fluid in certain parts of the body and trying to figure out where it was at. Now he had a student called uh, Rene Theophile Hyacinth Lenec, very flowery name, and he was kind of a very flowery person, very delicate. He had, um, uh, he got uh, respiratory disease very early on. We now know it probably to be tuberculosis, but he was never in great health. And he was also a very shy, retiring person. And at one point in uh, the very hot summer in Paris, he was called to listen to the heartbeat of, you know, the description is a very sweaty, unbathed, overweight prostitute who came in for treatment and his delicate little heart couldn't handle this prospect because back then you did listen to the heart by sticking your ear up on the person's chest. So he is described as fleeing the room, <laughs> like running away. But as he's outside kind of getting his bearings, he sees some kids playing a game where someone's listening on a piece of wood and somebody scratches on the end and thinks, oh, wait a second, I played that game when I was a kid. And he rolled up some paper and used that to listen to the patient's chest and found that it actually worked better than sticking his head on the chest. And he was an amateur woodsmith and actually designed the first stethoscope. Original stethoscopes were actually straight, kind of rigid with a little bell on the end, but uh, he wrote a book about diagnosing diseases of the lungs, and if you uh, paid a little bit extra, he'd send you a hand-turned, lathe-made stethoscope. So yeah, that'd be pretty cool. So the stethoscope is now kind of the universal symbol for, hello, I'm a doctor, may soon become point of care ultrasound on your phone, but right now stethoscope is still kind of that designator. And um, some people at the time thought it was a terrible thing because it put more distance between the patient and the um, examiner, the physician. But at the same time, it gave more power to actually hear the lungs, the heart, gut sounds, and so forth. Uh, he did pass away from tuberculosis fairly early, mostly because of his early exposure to it and the fact that he was continually you know, working with people who were ill, probably getting the occasional disease that way, and despite having done a lot to diagnose tuberculosis, didn't really save him from passing away from it. Now, I haven't really talked much about microbiology. We brought it up a little with Pasteur, more on that in a second, but obviously microbes and infectious disease have been with us forever. Smallpox is one of probably the oldest and most consistently known diseases affecting humans all over the globe. Descriptions of what we would consider smallpox come from all over the world, and it tended to be fatal in roughly 30 to 40 percent of those infected. You develop these massive pus-filled sores. They would often combine into bigger sores and slough off, causing scarring, blindness, other problems like that. And if people live, they would often be kind of scarred thereafter. So if you ever think about, uh, if you Remember those old, if you've seen old movies of like the French uh, court where people have like little black dots on their face, those were often to cover smallpox scars, was to actually have that dot cover the scar. So people, you know, had this disease for a long time and came up with ways to deal with it. Uh, China is the place we kind of can trace back what's known as variolation, where you take some dried smallpox crusts and kind of scrape it into someone's skin, hoping to induce a very, very mild reaction that would then give the person immune status for that disease. Now again, people didn't know why it worked, but it was known that if you did that, you could actually have people become immune to the disease. Now, what's the problem? What if you gave them a very potent dose? They could die of the disease, so they might not be exposed otherwise, and now you've killed them off, but it did, if people took very old crusts or ones that weren't very lively anymore, induce that immune response, which we now know to be a reaction to the proteins and other structures on the surface of the smallpox virus. 
Now, variolation did something really interesting, which is it bypassed Europe entirely. The idea of causing this in um, causing causing this low grade infection moved to the Middle East and it moved into Africa, skipped Europe and, Amer and the Americas, and didn't really show up in uh, America until the 1700s, and it was because Cotton Mather, the same guy who was the judge in the Salem witch trials, had a slave, a guy we only know as Onesimus, who kind of taught him about, hey, back where I'm from in Africa, we would do this to help people not get smallpox, and Cotton Mather actually urged people to do that variolation, and it's, you know, thought that it actually stopped a uh, breakout of smallpox in the Boston area from being as severe as it might have been. Uh, Washington actually made variolation mandatory for the Revolutionary Army, which was hanging on by a thread at various points in the war. So you could actually say this may have allowed the American Revolution to succeed because we had more soldiers staying healthy than we might have otherwise. Now, variolation was practiced, you know, it spread into Europe eventually as well, largely through uh, the Russian court and the fact that all the monarchs of Europe tended to be related to each other. And a guy named Edward Jenner was a rural surgeon, rural physician, who uh, kind of listened to uh, kind of a village gossip that milkmaids rarely got smallpox. In fact, almost never got smallpox. But because they were milkmaids, they always contracted cowpox relatively, er, relatively early in their career as a milkmaid. And basically, it would cause some sores and some pustules to f form on their hands. But it was very mild. And once they got it, it went away. And these people never caught smallpox. So he kind of uh, wrote back to his, uh, his mentor, a guy named John Hunter, who we'll hear a lot about in the next talk. And John Hunter, an early surgical and medical scientist, really working at an advanced level, said that Jenner should actually do an experiment to see if that would work. So Jenner uh, vaccinated an eight-year-old boy. Vaca means cow, so vaccinate means actually getting the cowpox, and did the same thing, took a uh, cowpox crust, kind of scraped it under the boy's skin, and then eight weeks later did the variolation for smallpox, hoping to you know, see what would happen. And the kiddo never had a reaction to the smallpox um, variolation. It never actually even had a mild reaction. And this kid was then functionally immune to smallpox. And this spread all over the world. It was very exciting. He was encouraged to uh, try to market it and license it, but he knew that this was a huge deal and made sure that it was uh, freely available for people to do all over the world by publishing it quickly. Uh, public reaction to vaccination then, shocking, I know, was not uniformly positive. And the criticism is just as hyperbolic as we might expect from recent vaccine uh, reactions here. So you can see we've got uh, the cowpox bubbling away in a pot there. We've got Jenner or someone else administered it to people and these people are having cows erupt out of their body. One woman's growing horns. People are, you know, one guy's got a cow erupting from his butt. I'm not quite sure exactly how that happens. But yeah, so people reacted like people do when something new comes along. But the fact that it worked so well really got it over the hump and people realized this is something that will stop smallpox. And anyone want to tell me what uh, one crazy cool thing about smallpox is? Go for it. Smallpox is the only disease we have eradicated. Now, there's an asterisk after that. There are labs in Russia, America, and God knows where else that do still have smallpox that's, uh, you know, there could potentially be used as a weapon of war or for research. But smallpox infections no longer occur because of the ease of the vaccination against it and the fact that it was carried out so rigorously because it's such a terrible disease. Uh, polio might follow soon, hard to say, but polio is on the list of diseases that we could probably wipe out if we had the funding and just the reach to get to all these far-flung places where it might be holding up. Now, last time we mentioned Louis Pasteur as an early proponent of germ theory, the idea that disease can come from microbes. And he kind of did this by disproving spontaneous generation, the idea that life, and especially kind of what we consider to be uh, not particularly 
wholesome forms of life like flies and maggots could just spontaneously erupt out of decaying tissue to decaying meat, that mice just erupted, came from rags and cloths that were strewn around. He disproved this by showing that meat, foods, and other things that were protected from the environment never were actually rotted. They didn't have the microbes settling on them, the dust settling on them that would set that up. And he was able to use his skill with the microscope to actually save the uh, French beer and wine and silk industries. The beer and wine industries were faltering because they were having uh, bacterial infections get into the process. And he discovered that the bad batches had certain microbes in them and the good batches had what we now know to be yeast in them. Now that is plenty on its own, but Pasteur also set his sight on rabies. Now rabies, he figured out some, you know, bit of chance, bit of planning, that if you weakened the rabies virus by progressively working it through different generations of infection, that the, uh, the virus could be weakened and that you could actually then inoculate somebody with this preparation and it wouldn't actually result in the full disease, but would actually give them immunity to it. And this is impossible to overstate. This is the first time an absolutely universally lethal disease had ever been treated and stopped. Not just palliative treatment, not just giving people the chance to fight it off. Rabies has a 100% fatality rate. I think there's case studies out there in all of human history of two people who have spontaneously recovered from rabies. So it is the first time we've actually taken a disease that is invariably fatal and cured it. So. Pasteur gets a lot of credit for that, and deservedly so. He did a lot of the experimental preparation, getting saliva from rabid dogs that were trying to bite him to get this rabies virus um, kind of into a place where he could progressively weaken it. And interestingly enough, the uh, first person who was ever treated with it was a small boy who uh, got bitten by a rabid dog while defending other small children. And uh, he was brought to Pasteur. Pasteur wasn't quite ready, but he knew that he was the only shot this kid had, so he did the preparation, did the treatment, and the kid survived. And that boy actually became the uh, guard of the Pasteur Institute for the rest of his life. All right, so all that's very inspiring. Now, Louis Pasteur wasn't exactly the nicest person. He was very much prone to self, um, self-promotion. He was a very great communicator. He made sure people understood him. But he insisted that he was right about stuff and you know, kind of denigrated some of the other people's findings that we now know were on a different track that actually had some validity to it. However, let's add up. Uh, we've got the cure of rabies, wine and beer, and silk undergarments, all thanks to Louis Pasteur. So yay, thank you, Louis Pasteur. <laughs> all right, now, the pharmacology that we've been working with up until this point has been very primitive. We've got some things like morphine, like plant extracts, like um, digitalis, but how and why they work is completely unknown. People could actually figure out what worked, but why was very much unknown. And there was still a great deal of medicine that was not just disadvantageous, it was very much har harmful. Uh, does anyone know what one of the uh, most common treatments for syphilis was throughout history? Drinking mercury, exactly right. So yeah, since syphilis is gonna kill someone anyway, I figure they just said that, you know, they didn't realize that the mercury was doing just as much damage and not helping them at all with their affliction. So great classic quote here from a guy named Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was a uh, physician, anatomist, and also a uh, writer, that if uh, all of the Materia Medica as now used could be sunk to the bottom of the sea, it would be better for mankind and all the worse for the fishes. So people knew that the equipment, the pharmacology that was available really wasn't that good, but they didn't have much else to work with. But as organic chemistry and biochemistry start to become an actual topic people researched and worked on, that started to change. Uh, first off, the idea that vitalism and materialism were opposed to each other kind of fell by the wayside. There was a theory of, uh, going around that living material was completely different from non-living material. And we mentioned this before, but the real proof that that was not the case came when urea, known to be a biological uh, molecule, was synthesized artificially. So that was basically the first sign that, okay, it's chemistry. Human function can be thought of as a type of chemistry. 
and Claude Bernard discovered that different things could actually affect the body differently. He worked with curare, poison arrow frog venom, or pardon me, poison, uh, that would uh, stop the neuromuscular junction. And Oscar Schmeideberg is considered to be the founder of modern pharmacology. And he did this by working with muscarine and showing that it had the same effect as electrically stimulating the vagus nerve. So if you stimulate the vagus nerve, what's going to happen to your heartbeat? It's going to slow down. Now, you guys didn't think you'd get away without a pop quiz, right? Okay. Pre-ganglionic parasympathetics meet post-ganglionic parasympathetics, and what kind of receptor do we have at that junction? Nicotinic or muscarinic? Ah, muscarinic. What do we have at the postganglionic parasympathetics to the target tissue? Oh, man. I'm not used to knowing more about, knowing more about uh, physio than anyone else in the room. All right, we've got nicotinic and muscarinic receptors, and they're named for natural substances that caused those effects. So it's now known that those substances mimic the effects of those neurotransmitters because they're basically the same material and that the chemical could have nervous t tissue changes and that's really where pharmacology got started. Uh, one of his students, John Jacob Abel, founded the uh, American Society for Pharmacology and Experimental Therapeutics and did a lot of other things, extracting active chemicals from bodily glands, like the adrenal glands. He discovered histamine and was one of the early people to discover insulin, although it took a while for insulin to become practical. But once insulin treatment became available, it fixed another universally fatal condition. And apparently it was really miraculous because as soon as they were able to give insulin to small children, essentially in diabetic comas, they perked right up. They were fine very, very quickly. So and yet another quick turnaround, you know, proven by the effectiveness of it. Now, as we're getting these pharmacologic implements going on, we're starting to look closer at what we eat. And so organic chemistry investigated food and classified the things we eat as having four essential elements to them, the proteins, the carbohydrates, the fats, and the minerals. And it was thought that this mixture is what kept us healthy. Now, one problem with Pasteur's germ theory is that it was so successful, it kind of shut down other routes of investigation. We now know that Pasteur was right about a lot of things, but it wasn't the only thing going on. There were other causes of disease, and some diseases like rickets, beriberi, scurvy, resisted any attempt to find a microbe responsible for them. Look as hard as you want, you can't find a bacteria or even a virus that causes these diseases because they're dietary diseases caused by a lack of some essential element inside your diet. And so these four elements were important, but Frederick Hopkins kind of figured out that there were other things too, these accessory factors. And the vitamin B was the first one that was isolated, but it was isolated in Japan and a mistranslation of that work really meant that no one in Europe, America, or other places saw it, and it was really kind of lost. Now, 1910, it's worth noting that uh, Japan, in the late 1800s, had, it was basically a feudal uh, monarchy run by the emperor or the shogun, and as they realized they were very far behind most of the Western countries in terms of military power, science, the Japanese basically set around to modernize, and they turned from a feudal agrarian culture into an industrial powerhouse in a generation. So within about 30, 40 years, the country had really just jumped forward in terms of that production of science, engineering, and so forth. And a lot of this early nutritional work was actually done in Japan, and microbiology was also a big staple there as well. So in London, a guy named, I love this name, Casimir Funk, proposed that some diseases might be due to a lack of a vital amine, which he shortened to vitamine. And then later when people realized, oh, they're not all amines, they're not all these amine groups, it became vitamin. So there you go. Vitamin is a term we get through that. And at that point, the hunt was on for diseases that had a vitamin-based uh, progression. So another Japanese physician, uh, Masamichi Mori, 
identified that night blindness, which we now know to be a vitamin A deficiency, was a non-infectious disease that could be treated through proper nutrition. In this case, cod liver oil was administered to people to keep them from getting it. Uh, pellagra, vitamin B3 deficiency, due to dietary deficiencies, could occur in people who had corn as their major dietary input. Now, corn doesn't have B3. It also doesn't have, it's not a complete protein source. So people who eat exclusively corn for protein, especially those farmers, especially in the Midwest in this era, would be prone to a lot of dietary problems. And Joseph Goldberger figured out that that was yet another vitamin. Beriberi is an interesting one. It's a disease that is a vitamin B1 deficiency, and it was seen a lot in Asia, and there's no reason it should have been, because the husks of rice, the main staple crop throughout all of Asia, has a lot of vitamin B1. But rice was, eating brown rice was considered to be kind of low brow, low class, and so people would dehusk the rice, polish it, and that pretty much removed all that B1. And um, a naval uh, physician, uh, Takaki Kanichiro figured out that, oh, the officers who are eating kind of like Western food because it's considered high status don't get beriberi, but all the low-ranking sailors are getting it because they're feeding almost exclusively on rice. And so they're not getting that, that white rice is not giving them vitamin B1. And then after World War I in Vienna, Harriet Chick figured out that B vitamin D we didn't call it that at the time, but vitamin D was required to prevent rickets. And so again, cod liver oil and figured out that uh, ultraviolet light could actually be effective in treating rickets or in adults osteomalacia, where the bones become soft because we're not able to create good, strong, mineralized tissues. Now, at the same time, people are still moving forward with isolating drugs from various uh, natural compounds, pharmacologic agents coming from plants became all the more impressive as people explored more of South and Central America. And cocaine, coming from the cocoa plant, was first used in medicine by a guy named Carl Kohler. And he was an optometrist. Now, Carl Kohler, this kind of blows my mind, figured out that you could use a uh, compound of cocaine to numb people's eyes and make eye surgery that much more effective. That blows my mind because one, that means eye surgery was happening before topical anesthetics. And you can hold someone down to a table and amputate their leg or take out their appendix, but how do you stop someone's eye from moving so you can actually do eye surgery? I have no idea how you can do that. But obviously the optometrists who, or ophthalmologists who were seeing these results knew immediately this was a huge step forward. You could numb the eye and work around the eye without having to be worried about speed and so forth. Uh, he actually got the idea from a friend of his who was a Viennese neurologist. This guy had tried to find reasons that, you know, how you could use cocaine for almost everything, but somehow missed the peripheral anesthetic qualities of it. But he did okay for himself later on. That was uh, Sigmund Freud who first put him on that. Uh, he actually was really strongly trying to use cocaine as a way to get people off of morphine. Didn't really work out that well. Now, we're just kind of doing some grab bag at this point because so many different threads of medicine and science are converging at this point as chemistry, pharmacology, and other things are becoming more and more advanced. And antibiotics were pretty much unknown until about the you know, early to mid-1900s. And the person kind of given credit for discovering penicillin is Alexander Fleming. And he was working, apparently he was kind of a sloppy scientist, and so his bacterial cultures would often get um, contaminated and he'd have to throw them out. But he was working on bacteria and noticed that he had a plate of staph, staphylococcus, and it was contaminated by, some, uh, by penicillin, a mold, but it actually caused this halo of an area where the bacteria didn't survive. Now, initially he thought, well, that's cool, but there's no way that's gonna be useful in a human body. It's gonna get degraded. So he kind of shelved it for a while, but changed his mind in the 1931 and figured out that you could actually use penicillin to treat bacterial infections. Now, it was difficult to get enough to actually do anything with. One of the early uh, studies that was done was in 1930, some infants who had uh, gonococcal infections due to being exposed to the gonococcal bacteria as they came through the womb, were treated with it in four out of five, got better. Normally that would have been pretty much blindness from birth onward with an untreated gonococcal infection of the eye. So that was useful. 
And then there was a nightclub fire in Boston that uh, you know, a lot of people got burned very badly. And in addition to the burns, the risk of post, um, of an infection thereafter was really increased because they didn't have their skin to fight the bacteria off. There was really no way to isolate them from and put them in a sterile environment. And so the use of penicillin in treating those people made everyone kind of pick up the idea that this could be a huge step forward. And that's good for lots of reasons, but also because we just entered World War II. And thank you to Margaret Hutchinson Rousseau here, graduate of MIT, figured out how to actually streamline the process of making penicillin and going from making ounces at a time to making a ton of it. And if that wasn't good enough, she also figured out how to make synthetic rubber because the Axis powers owned most of the, or yeah, were kind of uh, imperialistic in the areas that had rubber production naturally. And it's estimated that, you know, about on D-Day especially, penicillin saved about 12 to 15% of the Allied soldiers that would have died otherwise. So thanks to Margaret Rousseau, World War II went uh, the Allies' way rather than the Axis way. Now, we've also got a disease we mentioned earlier, another virus, polio. Viruses were tough for people to deal with because we knew that we could look for microbes under a microscope, but people figured out that there were infectious diseases that met all the criteria for being a bacterial disease but no matter how hard you looked, you couldn't find them under a microscope. And no matter how thin a filter, or not how thin, pardon me, how fine a filter you used, these infectious materials would still get through it and potentially still cause an infection thereafter. So once viruses were a known entity, we started having another way of dealing with things, and people generally adopted the idea that was used by Pasteur, trying to find a way to weaken that virus and then expose people to it so that they would be able to mount an immune response. So Jonas Salk came up with the polio vaccine in 1952. Polio was a very widespread disease, and he used live um, polio virus that was then treated with formalin, which is kind of like formaldehyde, which inactivated it, weakened it considerably, but left its antigenic surface, the area that your immune system can respond to, available for the immune system to react to. Now, because people have hypersensitivity reactions to some of these things, because occasionally that virus may not be completely killed, might still be a little bit active, there were problems, and that has fueled a lot of the anti-vaccine sentiment that's happened. There are you know, vaccines, like any medical treatment, are not 100% hit. But when you look at the fact that all these diseases are no longer endemic and no longer affecting us, we're really spoiled in that we don't see these diseases as often as we used to. Anybody who gets a chance to travel to Europe or Africa, especially in the Mediterranean area, there are still people affected by polio, and you can see them, you know, moving around. It's a little more common there because those diseases are still, I wouldn't say endemic, but experienced there. Now, switching gears entirely, I have no better place to put this slide, is CPR. How do we treat people who've had a heart attack, whose heart is no longer pumping? Well, prior to 1956, and probably quite a bit after that, because it takes a while for these things to disseminate, if someone's heart stopped beating, as a medical student rotating in the hospital, you were expected to whip out a knife, slice through their sternum, crack their ribs open like a book, and start massaging the heart directly by hand. There's a great description of this by a guy named Sherwin Newland, who's a surgeon, and he described doing exactly that as a third or fourth year med student. And he said, you know, the guy, guy went into instant cardiac arrest, and so he said, I whipped out the knife, opened the sternum, cracked the ribs, and I started pumping the heart. And he, about a minute or two into it, he thought, man, I hear somebody screaming. What's that all about? Then after a moment, he's like, oh, it's me. <laughs> Just screaming at the top of his lungs. So CPR, uh, created by an Austrian physician uh, named uh, Peter Safar, who was in Baltimore at the time, figured out that you can actually keep the heart moving through artificial pumping without actually opening the chest. Now, this blows my mind, and I'd love to see the institutional review board, patient safety measures that were uh, would be instituted now. But he figured out this worked by paralyzing 31 volunteers with curare, making their diaphragm not work, and then giving them mouth-to-mouth -mouth and CPR. I don't know how. Okay, first off, how did that got past the institution? And secondly, who are these volunteers? <laughs> 
So he wrote this up, came up with the ABC method of resuscitation, airway, breathing, compression, and we all learned that. Uh, he actually also contacted a Norwegian toy company and said, how would you like to make disturbingly lifelike mannequins that people can, you know, pump the chest on and blow into? And that's where we get Recessa Annie and all the subsequent variations on the resusc resuscitation dummies. And... If that weren't impressive enough, he also kind of started the first ICU, and I believe in the Pittsburgh area, created our first basic EMS service, because he, his, uh, sadly, his daughter had an asthma attack and died, and he thought, you know, if we could have gotten her to a hospital faster, we would have been able to treat her. The only reason she's dead is because we couldn't get her to treatment quick enough. And so he basically came up with the idea of and implemented the first emergency medical services system. And don't quote me on this, I'm not 100% sure, but I think it was in the Pittsburgh area where that happened. Now, World War II does something that a lot of things have done, and we'll bring this up in surgery again, and it's that people find new ways of harming each other and we then find new ways of healing each other to deal with those problems. And during World War II, we came up with ultrasound, not ultrasound, but radar, sonar as well. And some, some madman who I'd love to shake his hand, a guy named uh, Ian Donald, figured out, you know, this stuff we were using to detect submarines would be great if we pointed it at a person. And kind of came up with the idea of ultrasound, and his first big success using ultrasound was a woman who'd been diagnosed with uh, ovarian cancer and basically had been told, well, it's incurable, nothing we do is going to help it, and you're just going to have to make peace with that and go try to live out the day your days in safety as best you can. He did the ultrasound exam and figured out, no, it's not cancer, it's actually an ovarian cyst. Now, if this had burst, she might have died, but because they knew it was a cyst, they were able to go in, remove it, and she was thereafter fine, lived a long, healthy life after that. And our most famous kind of use of ultrasound now, fetal imaging, was first done in 1959. So from submarines to imaging babies, thank you, Ian Donald. Just be aware, people who make these connections, it's really good to study, it's really good to be a master of what you're good at, but the people who make these weird connections tend to be people who are good at several things. So never feel that you're supposed to be confining yourself to one thing only. You should have multiple ha hobbies, multiple interests. Doesn't mean you can do everything, but don't turn away from things you find interesting just because you feel that your specialty is telling you you should study one thing exclusively. Sometimes you make those connections in unexpected ways. Another connection like that is targeted drug design. A guy named uh, James Black in Scotland thought to himself, you know, we're isolating drugs from different sources, but we now know kind of what causes some of these problems, then things like he knows that you know that epinephrine binds to beta receptors. That's pretty well known. What if we made a drug that was like epinephrine, but actually competed with it, and we could actually cause, you know, a decrease in the actual epinephrine activity? And that's how we got propanolol, the first designed drug. And propanolol, great for bringing sympathetic activity down, decreasing anxiety, and basically that's the first time someone said we should actually just make a drug which is now a large portion of what pharmacology companies are doing. Uh, he was a very private person and was, quote, unquote, horrified to learn that he won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> oh, got to go to Norway. Ugh. <laughs> All right. As we get new tools, as we encounter new problems, we come up with new solutions and we apply them to old problems. So once again, nutrition, and vitamin deficiency still widespread in lots of areas of the world because food that's available, especially as monoculture is implemented in lots of places for commercial reasons and we lose the breadth of things that might have been raised prior, can become a problem. One of the things to keep your eye on is uh, the ongoing kind of, uh, she say, uh, saga of golden rice. So this is rice that's been genetically modified to produce vitamin A. And this can be useful in preventing eye problems and night blindness. So vitamin A pr deficiency is pretty, you know, pretty widespread in certain parts of Asia, India, and the sub-Saharan Africa. Critics say that you know, the amount of vitamin A produced by this rice is not enough to actually treat it. That's been somewhat dealt with. There are some legitimate uh, criticisms of it. Other people are worried that it's going to be commercialized. And as these controversies go, oh, we just lost. OK, no, we go. As these controversies develop, it really is going to be interesting to watch how 
treatment, distribution, and overall commercialization of these treatments affects the ability to get it to people who need it the most. So just be aware, these new treatments will come out, but not only is the treatment important, it's all the circumstances around it that make it available. That's it for today. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed it. Okay.